In this lesson, we will talk about multiple loops. That can be a simple loop one after the other, but the important case is one loop inside the block of another loop and it is known as nested loop. I'm writing a simple loop to print something five times. Now after that I can have another for loop and this time I am printing the same thing for three times. I can use the same loop variable over here because the second for loop will start after the complete execution of the first loop. So can you determine how many times this computer programming will be printed on the output? I think it shouldn't be difficult to guess that it would get printed eight times. You can count that. But now I want to have a for loop inside the block of this for loop. In the block of a for loop we can have any statement and that can be another for loop. This time I will not use the same loop variable i and should use some other one. I am printing the same message. Previously it was printed 8 times. Now what is your guess for this particular case? It will get printed 15 times. Why 15? Before that let me tell you that we call this loop as the inner loop and this loop as the outer loop. So the outer loop will get executed 5 times which means that it will execute its block 5 times. So what is inside its block? Inside its block is another for loop. So what essentially it means is that the inner for loop will get executed 5 times. So the inner for loop is printing the message 3 times and when this thing is being repeated 5 times, we will see 15 messages on the output. Let's see the execution step by step. Interpreter is on line number 1 which is the outer for loop. When I press step into, the loop variable i gets the first value which is 0 and interpreter enters into the block of the for loop. So now interpreter is on line number 2 which is a for loop. So this time loop variable j will get the first value of the range function. You can see j is also having the value 0. Print statement will get executed and it will loop back to line number 2. And now j will get the next value which is 1 but see that the variable i is still 0. J will get the next value which is 2. Now this time J is having the value 2 which is the last value of the range function. So it will not enter into the block of this loop. This loop execution is completed which means that the first iteration of the outer loop is completed. And that means the interpreter will move to line number 1 to get the next value of the loop variable i and execute the next iteration of the outer loop. You can see that over here, i got the next value which is 1, interpreter is on line number 2. On the watch window we can see the j is having the value 2. But that was because of the previous iteration of the outer for loop. Now this is the new iteration of the outer for loop, so j will start over from the first value again. So you can see j gets the first value which is 0, it will execute the print statement, j will get the next value and so on till j gets the last value of this range function. And now again all iterations of the inner loop are completed which means one iteration of the outer for loop is completed. So interpreter will loop back to line number 1. It will get the next value of i and this whole process will start again. I will simply run the remaining part and you can see 15 times computer programming is displayed. Now let's see if I have a statement over here. From the indentation you can see it is the part of the block of the inner for loop. So it simply means both print statements will get executed 15 times. You can see that over here. Now if I remove one indentation from line number 4, so you should easily see that this print statement of line number 4 is not inside the block of the inner loop, but it is in the block of the outer for loop. So it means that one iteration of the outer for loop will have complete iterations of the inner for loop, displaying the computer programming 3 times, and then it will print python on line number 4 and that will complete one iteration of the outer for loop. You can see that computer programming is displayed 3 times and then python is displayed 1 time. And then again we have the same pattern 5 times. What if I have a statement over here? 
Now, of course, this is not the part of the inner for loop, but is the part of the outer for loop. So you should guess that it will print welcome one time, then computer programming will be displayed three times, and then Python will be displayed one time, and that is one iteration of the outer for loop. And you can see that over here. So again, it is all about indentation, which is very important in case of nested for loops. To further see the values of the loop variables on different iterations of the nested for loop, let's just print the values of the loop variables i and j. You can see that i is 0 and j is having the values 0, 1 and 2. This shows the first iteration of the outer for loop. Then in the second iteration of the outer for loop, i is having the value 1 and j was having the value 0, 1 and 2 again. This will repeat until i gets the last value which is 4 and j again having the values 0, 1 and 2. So in a task of lab manual, there is a case of a 3x3 three three matrix. We know that in a matrix we have rows and columns. I want to take the 9 elements of this matrix from user and we know that the elements are indicated as A11, A12, A13 and so on. The first index shows the row and the second index shows the column. So I want to take 9 values from the user but I have to display A11, A12, A13 and so on to represent the elements of the matrix. Just as a side note, to work on matrix algebra, we have a package known as NumPy which we can install and different matrix operations are very easy and efficient over there. But at present we are just having a little demo of such case where we can use a nested for loop. So do we need a nested for loop over here? If you see carefully these rows numbers and the column numbers, you can see that row number is 1 and the column numbers are changing from 1 to 3. Then row number is 2 and the column numbers are changing from 1 to 3. And then on the third row, the row number is 3 and column numbers are again from 1 to 3. Which is the same pattern that we achieved using the nested for loop. So let's do that over here. I am using the loop variable as r to represent the row. And then in the inner for loop, I am using the loop variable as c to represent the column. Both rows and columns are 3 for the 3x3 three three matrix. I am taking the value in the variable e for the element of the matrix. Over here I am using the loop variable r and c which will have different value in different iterations of the for loops. Let's first see the output of this particular code. It says enter element a 0 0 because first value of r is 0 and the first value of c is also 0. In matrix the element starts from 1 1 so it would be better if I specify the values in the range function as 1 4 so that the values generated are 1 2 and 3. And now you can see the correct indices are being generated for these elements. Now let's have a simple task that we have to determine the sum and the product of all elements of the matrix. So I can declare a sum and the product variable before the start of the for loop. Then inside the for loop I can update those variables. Outside both of the loop I can print the result. I will also change this capital A to lower A because we usually represent the elements in lower letters and the matrix names in upper letter. You can verify if the result is correct. Now let's talk about this number pattern. The task is to display this kind of pattern. Now this is similar to rows and columns. See the first row which are the numbers from 1 to 10 and then the next row is 2 times first row and the third row is 3 times first row and so on until the 10th row is 10 times first row. So I can generate those numbers from 1 to 10 to have the first row and then I should have another numbers from 1 to 10 which I will be multiplying with those to get all these numbers. Let's do this here. So both loops are generating number from 1 to 10 and I can simply multiply both loop variables. 
R will be 1 in the first iteration and C will have values from 1 to 10 and when those values are multiplied with the value of R which is 1, they will remain 1 to 10. In the second iteration of the outer for loop, the R will have the value 2, the C will have again the values from 1 to 10 and when they will be multiplied by 2, they will give us the numbers of the second row. Let's run the code. The numbers are generated but we don't have those rows and columns because of course numbers were generated but every print statement displayed the number on a new line. Now what we can do here? First I should use a tab so that every new number is being displayed after one tab and then I can use the end optional input argument of the print function. I will set its value to empty string and every next print statement will be displayed on the same line. So if I run the code, apparently I can see some rows and columns but actually it is all in one line. Because of the limitations of the characters which can be displayed on one line, we can see the multiple lines over here. But in fact, it is just one line. Let me zoom out here and now you can see more elements in one row. If I zoom it further and further, you can see it is not exactly what we wanted to display. So now see carefully what can be the solution. This for loop generates a number which represents the first row and then the second row and then the third row. So we have to display them on the same line. I can say that the complete execution of this for loop generates the elements of one row and in the next iteration of the outer for loop, this inner for loop will generate another row but to make it like another row, I have to do something and it is very simple that I write a blank print statement over here which is not the part of the inner for loop but is the part of the outer for loop. So this loop will get executed completely and it will print the numbers on the same line because of the end optional input parameter and then this print statement will get executed which will print nothing but because we are not using the end optional input parameter. So in the next iteration of the outer for loop when the inner for loop will get executed that will start from the new line. And now you can see the exact pattern that we were interested to generate. Then in the lab manual, we have some examples and tasks as we know that one summation can be solved using a for loop and if we have a double summation expression like over here, that will be solved using the nested for loop. Now I will discuss this task. You have to find the sum of this series which is 1 plus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 3 factorial and so on till 1 over n factorial or we can represent that using this summation. For this task, my first suggestion is that instead of this particular series, which involves factorials, let's first have a simple case. And let's find the sum of this series, which does not involve the factorial. And it is simple 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 and so on. For that I can use simply a for loop where the loop variable i will change from 1 to n. I should have a sum variable and I will update the sum variable as s plus equal to 1 over i. Let's simply run this code and you can verify that this answer is correct. Now the actual task was finding the sum of this series. So what is the difference here? The loop variable i is having the value from 1 to n and for this case we have to first find the factorial of that number and then we will take the reciprocal of that. So I can write that as a comment here that find the factorial of this variable i. So we have a new problem here that we have to find the factorial of a variable i. We will not be using the factorial function of math module. We did this task previously that how we can find the factorial of a variable i. We need the product of all integers from 1 till that number. So I can declare a variable for the product, for example f for the factorial and its value should be 1. Now I have to generate the numbers from 1 till i. So I will have another for loop here. I will update the product variable as so. So this for loop will calculate the factorial of i. 
and this for loop is generating different values of i which are needed for that series. So now in this sum expression, instead of 1 over i, I should use 1 over f, where f is the factorial of i. So now if I run that, and let's enter the value 3, and this result is correct, which you can verify from the lab manual, or you can verify by yourself. So that was a good use of our nested for loop. One important thing is this statement. Can I have this f equal to 1 before the outer for loop? Let's run the code for 3 again, and we have a wrong result. The reason is that when we have this f equal to 1 before the outer for loop, this inner for loop will work fine for the first iteration of the outer for loop. But in the next iterations, when this inner for loop will be generating the factorial of variable i, the starting value of the product variable which is f here will not be 1. And that would generate wrong values of the factorial, which is the reason of the wrong answer. So I should have this statement over here, so that every time a new factorial is being calculated, this f is equal to 1 before that. Now in task 3, you have to solve the same series, but this time you will be creating user defined functions. One function that you will be creating is the fact for the factorial, and the other function that you will be creating can be named as my series, which will have n as the input argument for the index of that series, and you will use the first created factorial function inside this to determine the sum of the series and that sum will be returned by this function. For this case, you would not need nested for loop. Now the next task is interesting. Here you have to take a positive integer from the user and you have to display all prime numbers starting from 2 till the enter number. So let's do this task. I have taken the number from the user in variable n and I have to display all prime numbers from 2 to enter number. So first I can generate those numbers. So the range values are from 2 to n plus 1 and now what I need to do inside this for loop. I have to see if the value of loop variable i is prime or not and if that is prime, I will simply print that and otherwise I will not print that. So the new problem is that we have to determine if i is prime or not. For that, I will write the same logic as we did previously. I am declaring a variable as check equal to true. To determine if i is prime or not, I need another for loop to see if it has factors or not. And I have to check from 2 to the square root of that number. So I will apply remainder division on i by j to see if j is factor of i or not and if that is the case, I will make check equal to false. Now over here, I am outside the inner for loop but still I am inside the outer for loop. I will apply the condition on check variable. If check is true, it means that i was a prime number. So I will simply print that value. So let's run that. Let's enter 100. Last prime number is 97. Let's see the starting values. You can see these are all prime numbers starting from 2, 3, 5 and so on till 97. So here you can see the use of nested for loop. The outer for loop is generating the numbers and the inner for loop is there to determine if that number is prime or not. So that's all from this lesson. Thanks for watching.